Hans was mortified. He disappeared from public view and into the labs. Locking himself in, he wouldn't allow anyone in there. Eventually his father Wilhelm came to see him. In a few days, a major laboratory had been locked down, followed by an engine maintenance shed, which was to become off limits to all. All production was shut down, orders weren't met, but the two Professor Goetzes didn't care. More and more equipment was being delivered daily, but no one was allowed in Shed 17. Questions started being asked on Sodor. Where were the Goetzes? Would there be no funeral for young Thomas? And where was the body? They'd arranged for Thomas to be transferred to a mainland hospital. He'd been taken to the complex but was never moved by rail. We all assume the obvious, he was still in the lab. But, if Thomas was there, was he still alive? And what was the purpose of keeping him at the complex? Almost a year after the accident, the doors of Sodor Research were reopened. In an open invitation to the people of the island, Thomas rolled out of Shed 17. It took me a moment to realise what it was I was looking at. When he looked at me and said, Hey, Mr Hartley. It dawned on me what Hans Goetzer and his dad had done. One woman passed out as Thomas smiled at us. I had to run off around the side of the shed. Hey, are you all right, Keith? <laughs> as news spread across the country, the world's media rushed to Sodor Island. They kept trying to interview me. I became a bit of a celebrity. Controversy on Sodor Island. Questions asked about science ethics. It's fair to say I was pretty nervous at times. I'm joined now by Keith Hartley. But I think I put on a brave Sodor face. Island. What did you think when you first came to meet Thomas the Tank Engine? <laughs> Most of my mates said I looked pretty good on telly. The mayor said I'd represented the people of Sodor very well. It's important to show you're confident when people are asking you awkward questions. Good evening. An act of mercy or a crime against humanity. I enjoy now by... Even when some of the questions got difficult. I made sure I knew what I was talking about. What was your reaction when you first met a talking tank engine? If you can't make an informed opinion, or if you can't string together two words on telly, well, maybe you shouldn't be on there. there are two sides to this. Admittedly, the subject matter was a bit bizarre sometimes. There are some dark forces at work here. You were all right, as long as you could win over the audience. See this, they're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. <laughs> the Goetze family refused to answer any questions. Behind closed doors, the only question they agreed to answer had been asked repeatedly. Would Thomas work on the railway? The response was an emphatic no. Thomas's DNA had been reprogrammed to accept and adapt to the engine structure, using the engine's internal system to maintain his organic functions. What no one could be sure of was how much of the engine was mechanical and how much was organic material. Thomas had been able to move around without coaches, but to work on the railway, his engine would need to be fired up and operated by a driver and fireman. Since no one could be sure how much of the engine was Thomas, the pressure caused by the engine could rupture his organs from the inside, and the incredible heat could boil him alive. Professor Hans and his father vowed Thomas would never work on the railways. Similarly, the two professors were to refuse many requests by people from around the world who wished to be biofused into engines. There were billionaires offering to pay whatever they wanted to be converted into an engine or some other transport. Train enthusiasts too, and people with terminal illnesses were desperate to be made into trains. But for some reason, the Goetzes refused. But there would be other interested parties. 
eager to seize on the biofusion gold mine. The independently wealthy Topham Hatt staged a hostile takeover and within weeks had bought a controlling share in Sodor research. Immediately the policy of the company changed and so did the ethics. The medical supply wing was shut down and work began on mass biofusion experiments and operations. Anyone who could afford it, some handing over their whole fortunes, were turned into engines. But, along with the new policy, there would be worse to come. Biofused engines would be allowed, then obliged, to work on the railways. The first one we fired up was James. He didn't have the money some of these people had, and so agreed to basically sign his life away if they wanted to experiment further, or to take massive risks like this. As usual, the fat f had everything recorded. All kept classified, you understand. These recordings, shown for the first time, reveal the extent of Sir Topham Hatt's experiments. It was horrible watching these engines work on the railways some days. But the tourists wanted to see it. They expected it. And for me, it was work. But, with the new engine's increasing work schedule, came more and more accidents. Edward was first to have problems. He'd been filming all day for the new TV series they'd announced, and for his last scene, he had to pull into Wellsworth Station and whistle to the kids on the platform. Peep, peep! Whistled Edward. Thank you very much. Sadly, this was only the first in an increasing number of incidents. Harold had an obsession with aircraft and appeared to become a helicopter. The operation had gone well, but we had to ban him from being allowed to attempt flight. In an experiment kept secret until now, Mavis the diesel engine was to be the first biofused locomotive used on the railway. We fueled her up and everything seemed fine. Then things got out of hand. The diesel began to burn her internal organs. Everything organic in the engine was soon burning. Have you ever heard a locomotive scream in pain? We tried rinsing out the fuel tank with water, but by then it was too late. Mavis's body would be kept under lock and key indefinitely. In an unexpected U-turn, Sir Topham Hatt would ban fueled engines from being used on the island. Harold was never told why he couldn't fly, but the decision would keep him alive, if only for a little while longer. In fact, unknown to the outside world, there had been many failed biofusion experiments. That fat b kept the accidents a secret, and legal disclaimers had to be signed by anyone being biofused. So there'd be no legal action taken if anything went wrong. This footage shows engines being displayed to tourists during the off season. Many of these engines were failed biofusion experiments and were too ill to work or were already dead. They had to put a stop to that though. With all accidents happening, everyone started asking the same thing. Why had Thomas, the first engine, worked so well? Despite all the troubles the other engines had, Thomas had worked fine, seemingly oblivious to the other engines' problems and accidents. Keeping their problems a secret from the outside world, Sodor Research began selling the technology to other countries in multi-million pound deals. These countries would have less qualms about the use of fuel engines and even the modern electric trains. Even failed biofused engines were being displayed publicly in what would become a kind of freak show. To his horror, Professor Hans Goetzer saw what this was leading to, slavery of engines, and immediately resigned. <laughs> 